So welcome everyone to our second episode of Everyone's Welcome. I want to start by just sharing a little bit about why we're doing this webinar. It's such a strange and unusual time for many of us. And because both Shelley and I have been active in the faith community around disability inclusion, we wanted to create opportunities for people with disabilities and those who love them, for researchers and for professionals in the field to bring their stories to a new audience. We think our guests have interesting perspectives on a variety of topics, and we wanted to create a vehicle for them to share. So twice a month, watch your, watch your Facebook, your email, your Twitter feeds, and we'll let you know about what's coming up for our next webinar. If you have any questions for our guest, Elaine Hall, please type them in the chat box. We will be extending the webinar um, if necessary to accommodate questions. So the plan is for this to be 30 minutes, but Elaine has graciously um, agree to hang on for another 15 minutes. So don't hesitate to put your questions there. And just briefly, I know many of you who are here with us tonight, but for those who haven't met me, um, I direct whole community inclusion at Jewish Learning Venture in the greater Philadelphia area. And we work with all of the synagogues and schools across our area working to raise awareness about inclusion and accessibility. I am also a writer. I'm a mom of two great kids, including a 17-year-old son on the autism spectrum. So tonight's webinar really has a lot of personal interest for me. Thanks, Gabby. And I'm Shelley Christensen. Uh, I know so many of you who are on our, our call tonight, and thanks for being here. Um, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm, I am a consultant, a speaker, and an author. And I'm also the mom of three sons, one of whom lives with a disability. I'm also the grandmother to four adorable grandchildren. And I think one of the big tests of all time during this period of time is not seeing them every every day like we usually do. So um, I, I'm having some struggles with that. We're all having struggles with different things. And I think that's a big uniter. I also think something that's going to unite us and inspire us tonight is our guest, Elaine Hall. Elaine Hall is an internationally recognized keynote speaker, a media personality, award-winning writer, media consultant, inclusion activist, professional acting coach for TV, theater, and film. Elaine was a top onset acting coach when her son, Neil, adopted from a Russian orphanage, was diagnosed with autism. When traditional therapies did not work, she developed an innovative, creative-based methodology to reach him. These methods, now evidence-based, became the backbone of the Miracle Project, a fully inclusive, expressive theater, film, and social skills program replicated internationally and profiled in two, Emmy, in two films. One is a two-time Emmy Award-winning film called Autism the Musical, and most recently, HBO's newest film, Autism, the sequel. Elaine's memoir, Now I See the Moon, was the United Nations official selection for World Autism Awareness Day and also for Jewish Disability Awareness, Acceptance and Inclusion Month. Her students, once too shy to even walk into a room of their peers, have performed on some of the world's finest stages, such as Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center, Others have had guest starring roles on TV shows, a typical speechless parenthood and other shows. And Elaine has co-written over 30 original musicals. She is a consultant and a six time speaker to the United Nations and consults with TV and film writers, producers and directors, including Sony Pictures, Netflix, Amazon and Disney to ensure their content, content authentically portrays individuals of all abilities and encourages parents and professionals to see the ability within the disability. 
Elaine and her husband, Jeff Freimer, live in Santa Monica, California. And I just want to say thank you, Elaine, for being here with us today. Uh, we are all so excited that you're here and look forward to, to hearing your story. Thank Thanks you. Welcome. So Thank you so much, Shelley, and what a joy to share any time with you. <laughs> and so wonderful to meet you, Gabby, and thank you both for the incredible work that you've been doing for all of us, for all of us. Elaine, we're just, we're just so grateful that you could make this time, and we're grateful to all of you who made time to be here with us live, to, to be part of this conversation. So. Elaine, I'm going to jump right in and ask you to share with us um, what inspired you to start the Miracle Project. So that little boy inspired me. <laughs> I, uh, I was a TV and film acting coach, and I, I also, as Shelley had said, I, I also worked using the expressive and performing arts to bring out the best in, in, um, in children and teens. And uh, what I wanted, though, more than anything, I was called Coach E, and what I wanted more than anything was to be called Mama. I wasn't able to give birth biologically, so I chose to adopt my son from an orphanage in, in Russia, where my grandparents had come. And uh, when he came to me, he, he flapped his hands, and he spun around in circles, and he banged his head. But this was now 24 years ago, and Shelly, you weren't yet doing what you're doing, and Gabby, neither were you. So all of us were just trying to make it up as we went along. And all I knew was that I needed to connect and bond with my son. So when he would flap his hands, I'd flap with him. And we would play and flap around the room together, being birds. And we'd spin around in circles when he needed to spin and, and, and make it ring around the rosies. And I connected by joining his autistic world therapist at the time thought that I was kind of loony and fortunately there were some uh, specialists in on the east coast I live in Los Angeles and that's right we're all over the we're all over the map and there were specialists on the east coast uh, Dr. Stanley Greenspan, Dr. Barry Prezant who I like to say co-signed my insanity mm -hmm. and they kept encouraging me to to join my son's world, to find out that everything he did had a purpose and a need. And I started learning from them and others, and I synthesized what I was learning about autism with creativity, music, dance, and drama, which was my field, and created a methodology so that I could train others how to help my son. So it all started really working with this precious little boy. And what I found is that if I had one person, me joining my son's world, um, you know, minutes, hours, as much as I could during the day, what if I had more people? So I would train my friends how about autism and then have them join Neil's world. So we did it 10 hours a day, seven days a week until he emerged out of his severely isolated state, still autistic, still non-speaking, but happy, communicative. And that was when I learned that, that all behavior is communication and that his, to speak to his highest level of intelligence and know that he knows. And from that, well, I, sadly, I, I, I went through a divorce. Um, I lost a uh, uh, the big house I was living in and, and went, I like to say from, you know, shopping at the, the best uh, shopping grocery stores to, to uh, literally standing in line um, for, uh, for Thanksgiving, for food for my son and I. And uh, I knew I needed to do something. I knew I needed to work. And uh, a dear friend of both Shelley's and mine, Michelle Wolf, encouraged me to start doing what I was doing with my son for others. And I wrote a grant from the Jewish Community Foundation, Beginner's Luck, I got the grant to start what is now known as the Miracle Project, which uses the expressive arts, the performing arts, whoops, the jumping, what, like that, um, let's see, can we jump? To, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
I ended up telling my son's story in this book called Now I See the Moon and created the Miracle Project, which is a, a theater and film program for all abilities. And we can jump back to the other slide in that in so doing, my cousin Gloria kept telling me that my son was now, he was 13 and 12, and that I should be getting him a bar mitzvah. Hmm. That, which is a, for those of us um, uh, in, in the Jewish um, tradition, understand that that's when a, a, a 13, a boy turns 13 and they're able to, um, to read from the, uh, from the Torah, they're able to be given a certain amount of responsibility. And um, my son had autism and I didn't think that would ever be possible. But my cousin Gloria kept nudging me. And I say, cousins nudge away because I ended up creating a program called Neskadol, which is a bar bat mitzvah program for all abilities. And my son, Neil, was the very first person. And I just realized it, that his bar mitzvah was 13 years ago, probably today. Yeah. Oh, like the 26 or 27. Wow, I just got goosebumps. So uh, he, he was able to say a couple of words and he typed his, uh, his um, um, speech, mm -hmm. which my husband, Jeff, my new and current husband, um, who's an angel on the planet, he read the speech. And um, this, this program has now been replicated and uh, is still under uh, the, the original organization, Vista Del Mar, where I started it and it's still running. And we've now included religious education and I'm a consultant to uh, faith-based organizations all over all over the world actually in how to um, not just modify a curriculum religious education curriculum and not just include but as Shelley so beautifully says how to create an, an environment where everyone belongs and allowing the true spirits of everyone to thrive and that was that was um, my son's religious education. And um, all of this is, is in my book, Now I See the Moon. And I, I'm proud to say that my son today, uh, well, before we were in quarantine, uh, worked on an organic farm as um, he loves to be in nature. He types and writes about being in nature. He also is a speaker himself, even though he's non-speaking, non he speaks through his iPhone and iPad, and he joined me at the United Nations a year and a half ago um, to present about um, what it's like to be a non-speaking individual. And we, we actually are my, one of the nicest things I ever heard, I think, was from the UN um, leaders there when they said that having a non-speaking autistic, and I was able to bring seven other non-speaking autistics to the United Nations to present, and that it was groundbreaking, even for the UN. So I, I feel very blessed that I've been able to, to bring that to the world. So it was this young man and creativity and needing a job, <laughs> needing to work, that became the impetus for the Miracle Project and the, um, religious education and all the consulting work that, that I'm privileged to do today. What a story. And, and uh, Neil is, Neil just says amazing things. Neil's in my book. And I just wanted the world to get this idea that spoken language is not the be all and end all yeah. at all. And uh, wow, Neil's quite the guy. It's quite so, Elaine, I have a question for you too. And the question is, what, what have you learned since starting the Miracle Project about creating inclusive settings and support for children and teens and, and adults with autism? So I've learned so much. I think I'm constantly learning. My son, my friends, my students, the parents, Everyone is my teacher and every single day I'm learning more. But I think one of the most important things is, and I, it's always what I felt and I, I guess what I 
learned was just to really honor my inner life, my inner belief. Um, when the traditional therapists were calling me crazy, but I knew inside that what I was doing for my son was working mm -hmm. to really trust that inner, that inner conviction. And then also to really trust my higher power, my God of my understanding, Hashem, to really um, ask for help, learn from others always. And um, I ended up writing another book, <laughs> shameless promotion, uh, called Seven Keys to Unlock Autism. And the question about inclusion is it's not about just plopping a person uh, with a disability into a traditional setting. What I do through the Miracle Project and all the work that I do and when I work with organizations and, and, and coach, um, it's about creating an attitude of inclusion first by removing the obstacles to include, the fear, the misunderstandings, and to set the so-called normal people up to be curious, to ask questions, to, to want to know, to um, seek first to understand, then to be understood, to allow all of us to be able to learn from those who experience the world differently. Because in an environment of acceptance and appreciation, and that's really what I go through seven different keys of how to create a, an inclusive environment, it's all about the other people. It's not about the person with the disability. Mm -hmm. And it's not about, oh, let's make, make a ramp because you can make a ramp uh, to make things accessible. But if you have yeah. attitudes of the stink eye, it doesn't matter how physically accessible that um, organization is gonna be if it's not emotionally open and receptive and, and willing to, to appreciate differences in others then the physical changes are meaningless. I, um, I had a, a workshop on inclusion for faith-based organizations in Los Angeles. And the, one of the first things they would say is, oh, it's too expensive to be inclusive. And, mm -hmm. and I give this, and I, when, I, when I travel and, and speak, I, I give this like 30 seconds to being an inclusive environment. And I can do it really quickly because I know we're limited with time. But if everybody just starts to look at everyone in the, in the Zoom, you know, with distrust, with anxiety, with fear, with um, worry. So I'm gonna give you like 10 seconds to look at each other that way. And as you're looking, see how you feel in your body and see how you feel about someone looking at you that way, judging you, mistrust. And then take a deep breath and let that go. And now look in that same Zoom room with curiosity, kindness, willingness, appreciation, and see where you feel that in your body. Mm. Take a deep breath. Amazing. And maybe in the chat room, let me know which room would you rather go in, the first room or the second room? Wow, that's so powerful. You sent us some wonderful pictures from the Miracle Project, and I'm just going to put those up on the screen now, too, maybe. And Elaine, I had the pleasure of getting to watch Autism the Sequel recently. So for folks who may not know, um, if you haven't watched Autism the Musical, go watch it. And Autism the Sequel is now out on HBO. And I, I'd love you to share a little bit about what it was like, what the reaction was like when Autism the Musical was launched. And then now with Autism the Sequel, what, what kind of response have you had? Well, as I created this theater program, um, a group of filmmakers asked if they could film it, if they could film my program. 
And not knowing what I was getting into, I said yes. And they followed a session of the Miracle Project. Now, the Miracle Project is a fully inclusive musical theater program. And um, actually, if you want to go back to that, for that slide right before it, um, the uh, um, right yeah. before, yeah. So we have those with and without autism cre together creating original musicals, singing, dancing, acting, socializing, creating a complete culture of inclusion. And okay, now we can go back to autism and musical. A group of filmmakers asked if they could film a season, my, my uh, season of autism and the musical and I mean, the Miracle Project. And I just said yes. And that footage was purchased by Buna Murray Productions and um, became this film called Autism the Musical, which um, HBO aired on HBO in 2008 and ended up winning two Emmys. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm proud and, and, and honored to say that this movie really helped to change the way the world perceives autism. As uh, the brilliant director, Tricia Regan said, um, she wanted people to know that these children were somebody's baby. And it wasn't a movie about autism, it was a movie about love. So this film was able to be seen and brought, autism was brought into everyone's living room. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this was now, you know, 14 years ago, 13 years ago. So 12 years ago that, that it was on HBO. And then now, drum roll, just this month, Autism the Sequel aired, which showed the same five, they were then children, now young adults, and who they are today, and what their lives are like, and how they have created their own pathway in life. And each of these five individuals have their own story. In the first one, uh, we told their story and they were trying to figure out and the parents were trying to figure everything out. And in Autism the Sequel, this is their story and who they are and how they're creating pathways in the world. Um, as uh, Gabby was talking about earlier, Adam playing the cello and, and, and Henry, pursuing um, TV, you know, film and well, I won't give it away. You got to watch it. It's still on. Yeah. Um, and everyone and both of them right now are on HBO. So yes, yes. I just, I love this. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I couldn't wait to see it. Um, if you haven't seen Autism the Musical, you're going to get a sense of it in Autism the Sequel, but not as much as if you just dive in and watch Autism the Musical, because it really conveys family stories. And that was just so powerful to me. And when we saw it, of course, we were going through our family stuff too. So um, I, have a, I have a question for you, Elaine. It's what, how, what impact does, do the arts have why are they an ideal vehicle in your, in your thinking for creating an inclusive community? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you can go back to the, the first one. Uh, I mean, to the one right before this. Um, yeah, so the arts are a great equalizer. Um, I like to say that artists, actors, singers, dancers, musicians, we don't have to uh, learn how to think outside the box. We don't even know there is a box. What box? What are you talking about? So it's a great equalizer in quirkiness, in being able to uh, find ways of being in the uh, so-called um, uh, typical world. So the arts allow for self-expression in an already accepting, appreciative environment. And what we do at the Miracle Project, I, I I, actually, I, I train people now all over the world in, in these methods of um, using uh, the seven keys to understand themselves first, the teachers, the staff, volunteers, we call our, our other actors, our inclusive actors, co-actors, how to be in tune with their own self and accept and appreciate who they are first so that then when they enter into the world of someone who perceives the world differently, there's a sense of curiosity and a sense of, of wonder and no judgment. 
So the arts provides an opportunity where there's no judgment, where you can make up rules. We actually, we build a, a liminal space, a space that is not autistic and not uh, traditional or not disabled and not, uh, you know, abled, whatever. We create this other world, this liminal field of, of creativity. And um, we, we have all forms of communication. We have classes for non-speakers where their movements are their expression. Um, we have classes for those who need a lot of support and are able to find their own identity and their own agency. We write original musicals every year to um, allow the thoughts, feelings, intuitions, and insights and imagination of those that perceive the world differently to be um, expressed through music and dance and drama. You'll see this, we've, we're, we're now on Zoom. And so our, our, our students aren't isolated. They create a, we create a dynamic community where everyone belongs. It's, you know, Shelley's book again, of, you know, belonging to belonging. It's like everyone belongs in this artistic community. So the arts are huge. Temple Grandin speaks about how the arts saved her life. Um, I feel they saved my life. I was a highly creative, imaginative person. And through my writing and my singing and dancing, I was able to know myself and honor my quirkiness. Um, what's happened, which is so miraculous, is uh, in addition to our creating original musicals, we've be been able to create, it's, it's now evidence-based and we have social skills programs that are paid for by the state and covered mm -hmm. as an ability to draw connections between those with and without disabilities. And um, it's also now I mean, the lower picture um, here, uh, I've become a consultant uh, at, at, in the media so I, I work on the, on, on the TV show Atypical and many of my students have now gone on for professional careers in TV and film and becoming writers. Um, my son had a, a nice walk on part on, on Atypical and, um, and we write original musicals that we are performing the, I think, I don't know, someone have to tell me if it's not, but it is the first neurodiverse original musical written and performed by and starring those of all abilities, fully inclusive, but created on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So if you if you come to uh, if you you know come to my website, I can share with you about an original musical created on Zoom, and that's going to be up on June 11th. So we create bridges. The arts create bridges to the neurotypical world. And Elaine, I just want to add that I'll send your website link to everyone. So get to check it out there. So this is, this is really quite amazing. We're coming towards the end of our 30 minutes. I have one more question for you. And if there's anyone who has a question that you'd like to send to Elaine, please type it into the chat box now. But one question that came up while we were talking relates to my last question, which is for anyone who might be an artist themselves or a creative person who might be thinking about wanting to create, you know, a pro an inclusive project, but maybe feels a little hesitant or isn't sure how to start. And uh, one of our participants who's here, Karen, wrote about that sh her background is music. And she is hoping to start an inclusive program. And any advice you might have for getting started? Hmm, a great question. Um, trust that you know what you know. And um, I mean, I, I can share with you the techniques and the methods that, that, that I train others in. Um, I, you know, I do do coaching, private coaching and consulting. But I think first, just trust what you know and start doing it with just a couple of people, one or two people. You know, I started in my son's uh, um, playroom, you know, with, with him. So see, just trust yourself and, and go with it. And, and if you want some coaching and consulting, I, I do offer that. I, I only take a few private clients uh, a year, but I'm, I'm happy to help you with that. But I, I would say first, just, just do it. That's awesome. Um, Elaine, 
I am sure you can see in the comments. We so we are we're just coming to a moment where if you have to leave now, we certainly understand. But if if you uh, have a question, go ahead. And Alana, who is one of my colleagues, who is this incredible, incredible human being and practitioner, shared that she loved both of the HBO films and felt like she knew the kids and saw them grow up. I felt that exact same way um, from watching the sequel. And she wants to understand how people are still making TV and movies with seemingly no understanding of disability. And Alana writes that she just saw a new show the other day. It was clear that they hadn't talked to a single disabled person about their experience. How does this still happen? And can you speak to that, Elaine? Thank you so much for that question. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm committed to changing. Um, I work with a couple different organizations to help with that, uh, respectability. I, I work um, uh, uh, sometimes with Ruderman, um, but I'm, I'm brought in as a consultant on many projects and not all of them get seen. So I think disability in Hollywood is huge now. It's, um, we're better than we were and you're absolutely right, we're not there yet. Uh, I don't know if you've seen um, Fancy Nancy. It's a it's a, a animated series. Mm. Uh, it was a wonderful um, uh, uh, piece uh, created by Matt Hoverman, and uh, I was able to consult on that. And I think they did a beautiful job in starting starting. It's beginning. It's emerging. If you can think about the way we were in the '60s with um, uh, racial diversity, I think we're we're there. You know, we're back there where we're just starting to, to um, so it's evolving, it's emerging. And yes, it's not where we want it to be, but there are some shows that are, Amazon's doing some great stuff and it's not on yet. Um, I think Atypical is really doing some good stuff. They have a consultant that's working with them and uh, it, it's emerging, it's emerging. Elaine, one of the, I, I have a question too, or maybe yeah. a comment. Um, the show The Good Doctor, Freddie Highmore, High, yes, Highmore is not autistic, um, but he plays, he plays an autistic on TV. It's like the old joke, but it's not funny. But one of, one of your students from The Miracle Project, who is autistic, had a role on that show. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that or maybe what that experience was like for him or? Yeah, um, uh, one of my uh, former uh, alumni from the Miracle Project, Kobe Bird, uh, he was the first autistic, he was, he was a teenager to play a more severely autistic person on a show and he was acting, he's a phenomenal actor. And I really want to say kudos to The Good Doctor because they, they did do that. I also want to say that um, Atypical, the peer group, is all individuals on the spectrum. Season two and, uh, and three, they're all people on the spectrum in that peer group. And another, uh, many, many from the Miracle Project. Uh, this season, season three, um, Dominic Brown from the Miracle Project, who also ha has autism, and he's in that episode. And there's a number of scenes where you see the background actors and those are all students from the Miracle Project. So uh, there, we're doing the, we're doing, we're fighting the fight. And I don't even wanna think of it as a fight. I think we're helping to change attitudes and some people don't know what they don't know. You know, there was a time where people would say to me, well, we can't have someone on set that's autistic because they'll have a meltdown. And I would just calmly say, you know, I've seen a lot more meltdowns from stars. <laughs> on TV sets uh -huh. that I've ever seen from someone with autism. And I helped to, to educate, it's about education. You know, this is our happy place. My students, you know, can they stay 12 hours on a set? I'm like, it's a lot easier to be 12 hours on a set than 12 hours out in the, in the normie world, dealing with glances and weird people and too much sound. And so, our, our, so we're, we're, it's all about education and helping to evolve. I wanna add to that, my dear friend, Stephen Shore, who, it's uh, Shelley's and my spiritual brother, you know, because we are in the quarantine times, we're slowly starting to emerge. One of the first things Stephen said to me was, um, 
Elaine, how, how do we serve right now? What does Hashem, what does God want us to do right now? And I think that is something that we all need to ask ourselves. What is our, what's our service? Uh, for me, it was starting my classes on Zoom and I write a lot about anxiety and easing anxiety. And um, I'm happy to share some of those articles with you and um, all of us. And I just spoke with my 97 year old cousin, my 97 year, year young cousin, Fagy, And um, she said to me before she goes to bed every night, she asks herself, did she make someone happy today? Mm. And then she said to me, Elaine, we have to use our brains for goodness. We have to use our gifts for service. And I think that's something that, I mean, my gift was that I, I was already in the TV and film world and I knew the arts. And so my gift is how can I use that for, to serve? And I think everyone, that's our question. And Stephen Shore, thank you for asking me that. So, you know, it got me out of my own anxiety and got me into my, my mission, returning us all to our mission. Elaine, this is so incredibly beautiful, this whole conversation. I'm sure you saw in the chat, there's been lots of applause, lots of appreciation. Jake, who participates in the Miracle Project is here. Jake. Yay! Hi, Jake. <laughs> It was wonderful. I'm so glad you're here. We have an, an um, uh, we have a, a musical theater programs for adults, and and we have um, we just started the Alt Ad Poetry um, yeah. Society, which is poetry writing. So, and we're all doing it through Zoom. Jake, I'm so glad you're here. It's incredible, and I'm gonna let everyone know when I send you a quick thank you tomorrow. You'll you'll get that link to Elaine's website and. Shelly, I think you've got a couple of closing slides here. I do, and I, I really just want to thank you, Elaine, so much for being you. I, I hate when people say that, but I mean it. Um, I, I knew you back in the day when you, were, when you were finding your path. I think you were on your path at all times, but maybe you didn't know course where it would lead and and you are one of the most open and um just relying on you know just your in your internal dialogue and your internal life your inside life to guide you and it's it's just a pleasure to be your friend and to know you and to see how many lives how many lives you touch in your work and through your generosity for being here tonight um, I just want to thank you, my friend. Thank you, You're Shelley. Cool. You're one of my mentors, you know, your guiding light. And Gabby, thank you so much for all that you're doing. It's, you know, we got the, we got the whole country covered. We got West Coast, East Coast, Mid, so. <laughs> right. Have, it's amazing to be together. And have, and Zoom, have Zoom will travel. That's <laughs> right. That's right. I have a quick question, if that's okay. Sorry. Yeah, um, Elaine, you were, you were asking about the, you were saying about the musical you produced. Uh, is it going to be on one of the upcoming newsletters? Yes, yes. Okay. It's, um, it definitely. You said uh, June 11th? Yeah, and for that, okay. you want to come to the Miracle Project. So I'll, I'll type the Miracle Project. Okay. Website. And if you want our, um, we can start sending you guys, um, information about about the show on june 11th yeah awesome and elaine i'll include both of those websites in our communication tomorrow and people can sign up to be on your newsletter list and all that to stay connected with elaine so jake thanks for asking that and clarifying that and we're going to close shelly and i as we mentioned we are we are both authors and i'm so honored to share with you briefly about my book, The Little Gate Crasher, which, you know, Elaine, I love, I, I look to my family too for, for inspiration and guidance. This is the story of my great uncle who um, 
had lived an extraordinary life. His name was Mace Bugen. He was born in 1915. And especially as we go through this hard time of living through the pandemic, I think of all of his challenges and his incredibly resilient and fun-loving spirit. He was 43 inches tall. He had a form of dwarfism. And this was way before there was any idea of accommodations. And when Elaine gave us that exercise about looking at someone with judgment, that was how the world, the outside world, approached him. And his approach to life was, well, if you're looking at me, I'll give you something to look at. And he was, he was incredible. And the story is there. Uh, the Little Gate Crasher, you can find it on Amazon or any of your places you buy books. It's a wonderful book. I loved it. And uh, Mace, Mace was a character in the most endearing way possible. Absolutely. It's amazing. And my book is From Longing to Belonging. And it's a practical guide for including people with disabilities and mental health conditions in your faith community. And I too was inspired, my entire work is inspired by my family. It's inspired by love and it's inspired by fairness. And I wrote this book to, to teach and to talk about belonging as, as really the purpose of inclusion. That every single person should feel that sense of belonging that they matter, that they're missed when they're not there. And so it's, it's part guidebook, it's part memoir, it's part just teaching. And um, it's, it's just been such a joyous ride writing it. And, and now that it's out, it's been amazing. So um, also available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and it is a Kindle book for those of you. It's an incredible resource. Incredible resource, Shelley. Thank you. So we're going to be back in two weeks. Uh, we're just pinning down the date right now. Our next guest, we're going we're gonna to share a conversation with Liz Weintraub. And I know some of you know Liz. Liz is, um, she is an advocate. She is vocal. She is passionate. She lives with a disability and she is, she works now for AUCD, AUC, yes, AUCD. She has a, a podcast called Tuesdays with Liz. And if you want to, if you want to learn more about Liz, there you go. She's plain spoken and outspoken and she's, she's just a great, she's going to be a great guest. So if you want more information, please, you can reach out to Gabby or to me at these email addresses. You can Google us. You'll find us. You can find us on every Facebook and all those places. And if you registered, uh, you will be getting a link with, the video, with this webinar on YouTube. And we, we encourage you to share it so that people can learn about the amazing work that Elaine does and can continue to come back and learn about all the, the wonderful work that people are doing in this world. So I wanna thank you again. Gabby, thank you for doing this with me. And Elaine, thank you for being here and sharing your, your, your gifts with us. Um, so everyone stay safe, be well, and take care of yourself. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.